Hello world, Greg Strike here, and welcome back to The Curious Place. I'm glad you're here. For close to a year, we've been hacking away at our home-built computer, and we have learned a ton of electronics basics along the way. We built the KCS mixtape from the ground up, and eventually used it to boot our computer from cassette tape. We also learned about the clocks in computers, and powered our computer using the swing of a pendulum and a human heartbeat. And in this video, I want to see if we can combine two things that I love. I want to see if we can get the KCS mixtape to play an original Nintendo Entertainment System using nothing but sound. Let's get started. Do you know what this is? Well, yeah, you know what this is. This is the original Nintendo Entertainment System released back in 1985. Do you know what this is? Well, yeah, if you've been following the channel for a while, you know what this is. This is the KCS mixtape we designed in previous videos, and it's a kit that you can build at home, and it can convert audio data into binary data to be tied into your electronics projects. I love this thing. And today, I wanna see if we can get this to control this using nothing but sound, essentially turning the KCS mixtape into an automated NES controller. How many of you can relate to sitting down to play Contra when you were younger, struggling to enter the Konami code just so that you could start the game with 30 lives? I know I certainly struggled with it. I would be resetting the NES constantly, entering the code improperly, just so that I can finally get my 30 lives to play the game. I mean, seriously, nobody can beat that game with only three lives. Nobody. NES controllers are remarkably simple devices. There's a total of eight buttons on here. We have the four arrow keys, the start select, and then the B and the A, and then it connects to the NES using the seven pin proprietary connector. And that might seem a little strange at first as there's eight buttons, but only seven conductors here. You might think that this should have nine conductors, one conductor for each button and then the ground, but that's not actually what we see here. Um, and if we're gonna be building a custom automated controller, we need to figure out what's going on here. Well, inside this nostalgic little device is a single chip, a CD4021 chip called a shift register, and it's what makes the fewer wires possible. We talked about shift registers in part two of building the KCS mixtape where we met Shifty, a shifty-eyed fella who takes serial data and converts it to parallel data. Uh, you can find links to the KCS mixtape in the video description. But the shift register in the NES controller is a little different. It's still a shift register, but the difference is it operates in the reverse. It takes parallel data like this, grabs a hold of the data, and spits it out one bit at a time serially. So this shift register is being used as a parallel in serial out shift register. And since it only sends one bit at a time, we only need a single pin to handle the data. As a result, we need fewer wires. And that's why we see fewer than nine pins. So we understand why we need fewer than nine pins, but how does it actually work? Well, let's take a look. Here's the seven pin port located on the NES where the controller gets plugged in. And it's fairly well documented online, but here's a quick overview. We have ground and power here. Every circuit needs them. This one's no different. And the controller runs on five volts and the NES provides power to the controller through these pins. Mind blowing, right? <laughs> We then have these two pins here, and according to some online resources, these are used for special controllers. But for us, we're gonna mimic a standard controller, so honestly, it doesn't really matter. We're not gonna use them, so we'll leave them as not connected, leaving us with only two pins. Well, then we have our data line here, which carries the button data to the NES one bit at a time after the shift register is done converting it. Now, this one here is called the latch pin. This pin tells the controller to grab the current state of all the buttons and store each state on the shift register. These are the states that are eventually sent to the NES over the data pin. Then the last one, it's called the clock pin. And once data is latched or stored on the shift register, this pin tells the shift register to shift the data, which sends a single button state to the NES. After a few clock pulses, the shift register will have sent the state of every button to the NES. And that's it. That's all the pins it takes to send the controller state of all eight buttons. Only seven pins, or actually five in this case because of the two unused ones. So now that we know what the pins do, let's see how they actually work. 
To do that, let's greet our old friend Shifty to give us a simplified view of how this works. Hey Shifty, how's it going? This shift register has eight inputs and each button on the controller is connected to its own input like this. Then we have the data pin where data is being sent to the NES. Then the two others, latch and clock, which are controlled by the NES. Not shown here are the ground and power pins. The buttons on the controller are configured in what's called active low, which means they're considered active or pushed when the signal coming from them is low. So when they're not being pushed, they will output their normal state, which is high, like this. Watch what happens when I push the start button. The signal goes low, indicating that it's being pushed, and it'll stay here until I release it like this. Now, we can see the same behavior if we push multiple buttons. So if I push right and B, just like if we were running in Super Mario Brothers, we'll see these both go low, indicating that they're being pushed. But as of right now, the NES has no idea that we've hit the start button before or that we're even pushing these two buttons right here. In order for the NES to know about it, the NES has to ask the controller for its current state. And to do that, the first step the NES takes is to send the controller a latch signal. Now, watch closely because as soon as the NES sends a latch signal, all the states of all the buttons will get stored right on the shift register. Also note that whatever is in the top position is always presented on the data pin, making it available for the NES to read. So in this case, just from sending the latch signal, the NES is now aware that the A button was pushed as shown on the right. But now, the NES needs to get the rest of the data stored on the shift register to know the state of the rest of the buttons. To do this, the NES sends a clock pulse, and as soon as the shift register receives the clock signal, all the data is shifted up, and the NES can now see the next button, which is B. And it happens to be low, indicating that B was pushed. Now the NES sends a series of clock pulses to read the rest of the buttons. And what we see on the right are all the button states that were stored on the register when the latch signal was first sent. From here, it's up to the video game to decide what to do with that. If this were Super Mario Brothers, with right and B pushed, Mario would be running to the right. Now that we understand how the controllers work, we need to get this on an oscilloscope to look at some real life signals. And up until this point in the project, I actually didn't have an NES yet. And this gave me a good excuse to buy one, so I bought one off eBay. And it arrived in just a couple days, giving me the opportunity to show my girls my favorite video game system from my early childhood. Just look at that stupid look of pure joy and excitement on my face. Now that we have it, if we're going to hack this thing, we need an easy way to access the signals. And I'm not ready to cut into the wiring or damage the hardware. It's just a little too valuable for me. So I bought this Nintendo controller extension cable off Amazon for only a few bucks, which I happily cut into and soldered these jumper wires in for easy access. The color coding of the wires match the graphics from earlier. So let's hook this up to the oscilloscope and turn on the NES to see what's going on. On the top we see the data line, and below that the latch signal, and then the clock pulses below, which are the signals shifting the data off of the register. Now, here I'm not currently pushing any buttons, so the data line is staying high, but check out what happens when I push up. You can see this area of the data line go low, indicating that something's being pushed. Now, let's try pushing down. And we'll see another section of the data line go low. With this, we now know that each button has its own corresponding clock pulse below, so let's try the others. Left. Right. Select, Start, B, and A. Now, let's try my Mortal Kombat fighting style and just mash a bunch of the buttons. Notice how many button states can be read all at once. That's pretty cool. Now, if we zoom out, we can see the distance between latch signals, which is occurring around 60 times a second. Zooming back in, if we measure it out on here, we'll see that there's only about 16 microseconds between each clock pulse and the whole latch clock cycle happens in only about 140 microseconds, which is over a thousand times faster than the blink of a human eye. That's incredibly fast. All right, I feel like we've gained a pretty good understanding of how NES controllers work, so our next step is to automate it and build a circuit that presents itself as a normal NES controller to the console, but also gives us the ability to set the buttons however we want. So to do that, we need to build a custom NES controller. And through the power of video editing, 
Here it is. I drew this thing out in KiCad and then I built it on this breadboard. And we have three chips on the board and eight LEDs indicating which buttons are currently being pushed. Let's take a look at how it works. At its heart is the same CD4021 shift register we learned about earlier. And it would have been possible to use other shift registers, but since this is what's used in the original NES controller, I knew that this one would fit the specs that the NES was expecting. So working it backwards, we know that if we can get data onto this shift register, the NES will be able to read it. So the next step backwards was figure out how to get data on this chip. And if you think about it, in a normal NES controller, the shift register can read the state of the buttons anytime the NES asks it to. They're always connected and available to the shift register. But in our case, we don't have buttons that are always presenting a valid state. We have the outputs of some random circuit, and in this case, that's the KCS mixtape, where outputs are driven by some other shift registers where data is gradually shifted into the correct position on the outputs. If we were to read data before that, not only is it possible, but it's very likely that the NES would ask the controller to latch the current state before the data is ready, giving us the wrong button states. So we need to give our custom controller the ability to grab button states anytime it's asked and only when data is ready. So to provide this ability, I used a 74HC574. It's a chip that has eight D-type flip-flops which are edge triggered. And if you're not sure what that means, that's okay. What you need to know about this chip is that anytime it receives a clock pulse, it will latch or store whatever data is on its inputs anytime it's asked, and it will keep that data presented on its outputs at all times. So if we continue to work this backwards, this is the chip that needs to act like our buttons, that is, always have states available. To do that, the outputs of this chip are connected to the inputs of the shift register so that anytime the NES asks the shift register to latch the current state, the states will be coming from this chip, which will always be available. Now we need to feed this chip some data. To do that, we need to connect the inputs to something. In this case, it'll be the outputs from the mixtape, but in the future, it could be something else like an Arduino. But how does the data actually get on this chip? For this build, that clock pulse will come from the mixtape, which has a KCS state pin. That's the pin that gives us a falling edge anytime the mixtape has finished decoding a byte. So when it has fully decoded a byte, the KCS state pin transitions from a high to a low. The one problem with it is that the 74HC574 chip clock, it needs a rising edge, which is the opposite. So to account for this, the signal is sent through an inverter and the 574 now gets a rising edge from the mixtape when the byte is ready. And when that happens, that data on the mixtape becomes immediately available on the output of the 574 and is ready to be read by the shift register, and thus the NES. To give this circuit just a little more flexibility, I added a switch, which is not depicted here, that allows me to decide whether or not to send this clock signal through the inverter. So now, depending on what we connect this to, we can choose whether to latch that data on a rising edge or a falling edge, giving this even more flexibility. Pretty cool. And no circuit is complete without some LEDs. So some LEDs were installed to the outputs of the 574 so that we can see the buttons that are currently being pushed. So with all that, it's time for me to perform my favorite ritual, the sanity check. To test it, we just need to encode some data using PyKCS, link in the description, to a WAV file and send it through the mixtape. <laughs> awesome, check it out. I'd say that's working pretty well. And it may be difficult to see on camera, but if you look closely, you can see the LEDs on the mixtape where data is gradually getting shifted in, but the output on the controller circuit is nice, steady, and always available, which is exactly what we want. So this thing is working perfectly. One thing I noticed though is I have the label on the button mappings backwards, but I planned for this because I'm me and I always do something like this, and I printed a reverse label at the same time as the original. Replacing that label corrects it, and I think we now have a working NES controller capable of being automated. Now, I just need to find a way to feed some button pushes to it. To feed it some actual buttons, I recorded myself playing Super Mario Brothers in the FCE UX emulator using an embedded tool called Taz Editor. Taz Editor finds its roots in the speedrun gaming community and is a tool originally created to create tool-assisted speedrun recordings. Basically, using Taz Editor, you can create extremely precise controller button presses down to the frame level and then save those for playback later. And that's the functionality I'm going to use. I saved the button recordings to a binary FM3 file, Taz Editor's native file format, and wrote a quick Python script that extracts just the controller state data and stores it in a separate binary file. With that, 
I was able to use PyKCS to encode it to Kansas City Standard, and we were now ready for the very first sanity check with some Super Mario Brothers action. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> Go, baby. Go. <laughs> it's starting. So clearly there's some room for improvement here, but this was a successful test. Mario is doing the proper movements, but the timing of it is just absolutely awful. The Python script I wrote didn't take into account timing whatsoever. It was just pushing out button state data as fast as the Kansas City standard 300 baud would allow us. So this was great for testing button mappings, but if we're gonna be playing a game, we need to do a little bit better. And if you remember from our oscilloscope measurements, the NES reads the controller 60 times a second. And we also learned in previous videos that the Kansas City standard supports 300 baud. So the NES is expecting to be able to read eight new button bits 60 times a second, which is 480 bits every second to get the precision we need. This is way more than the KCS can support from even just a raw data perspective. Keep in mind that the 300 baud also needs to include the start and stop bits in that as well. So to help lower the amount of data that we need to send, what we can do is only send button data when button states change. Since the 574 will present whatever data we last sent it on its outputs, we don't need to be constantly sending button data to it, we only need to send the changes. So the other improvement we can do is take into the amount of time it takes for the KCS to send a byte. If we know when the button is supposed to be sent and we know how long it takes for KCS to send it, what we can do is actually subtract that time so that the byte arrives at the proper time. So I started over and wrote a Python program that takes all these timing improvements into account. The new script can directly read a Taz Editor FM3 file, extract the player one buttons, and convert those buttons directly to a Kansas City standard encoded WAV file with all the new timing. It's an absolute mess of a script, but I've still made it available on my GitHub. Good luck with it, guys. Uh, with all the new timing stuff done, let's watch the first time I was able to test the new improvements. confused. Oh, he got messed up. Oh no. Oh no, too bad. It was so good. So I have a few other ideas on what we can do to improve this. Uh, one is to potentially upgrade the KCS mixtape to support cuts. Cuts is basically the Kansas City standard, but at 1200 baud. Uh, the other thing would be to maybe take into account the setup time, that is how much time it takes for data to be presented on an output after it's received a latch signal, that might help. Uh, the other thing, might be just going a completely different route here and actually count the amount of latch frames that we've received in order to know exactly which frame we're on. That might actually work. Um, but I'm curious if anybody out there has any ideas on how to keep things synchronized while still running at 300 baud. What am I missing? With all that said, I realized that I had one more fun way to make this project just a bit cooler for this video. Since I designed the circuit in KiCad, it was really hard for me not to go the next step and get a custom PCB made. Check this out. I call this the NES Automatica. And it's the same circuit from before, it's just beautiful. And I just needed one for this video, but I had a few more made anyway. And I had no clue what I was gonna do with them, but I decided that it would be fun to send the rest out to patrons until they're gone. So if you've been considering supporting the channel and would like one of these PCBs, this might be a fun way to do it. Uh, you would just need to provide the chips. Patreon link in the description. With all these improvements, let's get the NES Automatica hooked up to the NES and see if we can finally get the Konami code entered automatically for us. You know how many times that took me as a kid. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here, guys. I appreciate each and every single one of you. For those of you that are clicking the like button on my videos, I want you to know that I see you. I see you and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me. That's all for now, guys. We'll see you real soon. Have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.